Okay, thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, welcome to the gallery. I want to thank the Long Beach City College Foundation, who generally provides the money so that we can put on these events. Uh, we generally have two events in the fall and two events in the spring. In the spring, we're going to be having Derek Brown, a kind of well-known um, slam poet. Um, I don't know if he's going to be defined that way, but he kind of came up with the slam network and has published lots of really famous uh, slam poets. Uh, and then we also have Lisa Glad, who's a novelist, so we will continue to have a poetry uh, person and a fiction person coming next uh, spring 19. And we will be back in the uh, P building, so look for us, you know, look for our classes for novel, poetry, and for short fiction. Um, I would like to also ask you to um, silence your phones. I'm going to check mine right now. <laughs> it's <been> good. <clears throat> um, and now I want to talk a little bit about uh, Marco Vasquez. Uh, Marco Vasquez was uh, born and raised in East LA. Um, he received his MFA in creative writing at California State University, Long Beach. He is also the author of Standing at the Corner of Trouble and Sacrifice, Tripping Over My Machismo, which is this little book here that I published. Uh, one of my first chapbooks, I used to do a little uh, publishing company, and this is, I was looking at the date here, it's from 2000, no, not 2000, 97, the 90s. Wow, Nine, no, 99, this is 99. So, wow, I've known, known him for a long time. It's beautiful. This photographer, Marco was telling me, is now really famous, which is interesting. What's his name? Greg Mahorkas. Greg Mahorkas. Yeah, so that's interesting. I wonder if I can you know, sell this on eBay. Maybe. <laughs> uh, you, you can sign it, right? Sure. Okay, we'll have a little more money for this. <laughs> we'll donate it to the school. Um, or to my pocket. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, he, uh, he is also the author of East L. Alien. Uh, as we go along, which was edited by Gary Soto as part of his uh, Chicano <coughs> experience. He is a, an award-winning playwright. He won uh, for a Maz contest. Was it Traco Poetry? Teatro, Teatro Maz it was Teatro called. Teatro Maz, yeah, Morrissey, right? Yeah. Using Morrissey lyrics? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, it's right in there with, you know, the Latin mix, right? Uh -huh. um, so he is a, a, an award-winning playwright, a Push Park Prize-nominated author. And uh, his first novel, Stephen Isn't Normal, which we will be offering for sale here, and he'll be reading some from, uh, just recently uh, is a recipient of an International Latino Book Award. Uh, I've been a fan of Marcos, as I've said, for a really long time. We met at Cal State Long Beach in the late 90s. I, found this old vendor, the first one that I published, and he's in here, and it's kind of funny, I was looking at his, um, his uh, bio, and it said that he was currently working on his MFA, and uh, he lived in East LA, and his favorite pastime was chili gum. <laughs> and then I was looking at the bio on this book, and it said that um, he was still in, East LA, but he had received his MFA, so he had received it. Now he enjoys brisk box, but his favorite pastime by far is sitting. <laughs> now I think he's writing novels in his pastime. Yeah, still um, sitting. But I really, really enjoy his poems. Um, you know, I grew up in a very deadly serious, I'm half Mexican, Latino family where machismo reigned and was just awful but funny. Um, all my uncles just, you know, were so, you know, serious and macho. And I see, I saw in his poetry that he was kind of turning that macho and his upside down. Even the book, you know, Tripping Over My Chizo, is kind of examining the faultiness of that behavior and kind of turning it upside down and, you know, being self deprecating through that. So I really like that he, you know, mixed those very serious ideas. Uh, of ethos and pathos with American pop culture, humor, and intellect. And uh, he you know, offers a wide range of emotions. And you know, he reminds us that the human condition is complex. Life is absurd. Life is joyful. Um, I like that his work is accept accessible and fun. He is wonderfully imaginative. And 
now he's also a novelist. And I see that ability to create voice and poetry that has been in his poems, and I see it now in his fiction as well. So please help me give a warm welcome to Marco A. Vasquez. Wow, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I only hope I could live up to that uh, introduction. Um, that was such kind words. I wanted you to keep going, Jeff. That was amazing. Um, but anyway, I'm going to uh, read a f bunch of poems. Also going to read a little bit from my novel. And uh, let's see how it goes. I hope you, uh, you enjoy it. Uh, and uh, congratulations to those people who are getting extra credit for being here. So good for you. But I'm going to go ahead and set the tone right away. I'm going to be reading a poem called Trouble from my first uh, collection of poetry, or chapbook, called Standing at the Corner of Trouble and Sacrifice, which is one of these deals where my book is on here, and if you flip it upside down, it's my buddy Tim's, and it's, so, I don't know, it's like one of those two books in one, back in the day when you can get a bargain. Uh, but here we go, this is called Trouble. <clears throat> we went to the taco truck, where the drunken eat out of damp napkins, leaning on the warm hoods of customized cars popping whole turnips into their masticated mixes, where the guy with the hairnet and baggy jeans pushed me with his prison arms for taking a second glance at his woman's ass, plump, vacuum sealed in black denim. I didn't want any trouble. When he pushed me again, threatening me through tight lips and clenched teeth, my friend suggested that we leave because it wasn't worth starting anything with this guy, and besides, our food was ready. I knew that as soon as I left, he would tell that girl and her ass, how much of a pussy I was, and that she better not ever cheat on him or he'll kill her, and she knows he will. She'd say that she knows, kiss him long on the mouth, then drive home and have sex in his father's garage. I pictured myself beating the guy with fists and elbows, dodging his punch, grabbing his arm and busting it at the joint against my knee. Thinking this, I ate my tacos with extra red salsa, making my eyes tear, my forehead sweat, my nose run, burning my tongue, enjoying the self-inflicted pain, and looking forward to waking up and shitting fire. Just wanted to set the tone right off the bat. Um, this next poem, um, it deals with one of my favorite subjects, my father. Um, and it was published in this uh, anthology called Gutters and Alleyways, which is out of Long Beach. Um, Nancy Lene Wu and Sarah Thursday, who are big, big Long Beach people, and uh, the, the whole anthology itself is pretty good, not just because I'm in it, obviously, but uh, if you ever come across it, I think it's a very, very wise investment. Uh, this is called Overtime. <clears throat> Dad has worked too hard for too long. Even when sleeping, his eyes show the constant strain of squinting the sun away. He leaves too early for anybody to wish him a good day watching the sun rise in his rearview mirror. He works for more than what he makes and knows it, but he works. Occasionally he comes home, lifts me in his hands, hard like the paws of a stray dog, like a sack of concrete mix and rubs a seven o'clock shadow on my face until I giggle to tears. Other times he gets home after a long drive filled with brake lights and middle fingers and a realization that this is what his life is all about. He walks in greeted with silence, grabs me with callous claws, and beats me with the short end of a stick until we feel the same. Never telling me that it hurts him more than it does me, because I already know that when I see my skin bruising, it's his blood that is clotting. <clears throat> that always gets me a little bit. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this next poem is from that book that Jeff was uh, talking about, uh, Tripping Over My Machismo, that Jeff uh, very generously published back in 1999. And it features uh, my very first poem that I ever had published. Um, actually, that's not true. I, uh, there was another one that when I was like, in high school that I published in like, some Morrissey uh, fan magazine called uh, The Dark and Underpass. Uh, <coughs> uh, but I don't, I don't even have that one anymore. I, I don't think I would read it anyway. But this one is the very first poem I had published at uh, Kelsey Long Beach. Uh, uh, they have a little anthology that they publish every year called Rip Rap, and it's called Tongue. <clears throat> My tongue was badly burned by a deep fried chicken thigh. It feels all fat and fuzzy. The girl who says she's just my friend, who I've yet to see bottomless, but who drinks with me some nights 
and acts like she's my lover when I take her home reminds me in the morning that we're just friends. That girl who kisses my elbow when I bump it on the table. That girl who kisses my temple when our heads hit when she hugs me for a picture. Will she kiss my tongue when I tell her it's burnt? Or will I forget to tell her and then remember after we drink and not see her bottomless? We'll act like lovers on the way home and I'll ask her for a couple of bucks for gas. That will remind me that she is still just my friend. And even though my elbow no longer hurts and my temple no longer feels pain, my tongue will remain, amongst other things, swollen for days. <clears throat> oh, and from that same uh, anthology is uh, another poem called It Never Fails. <clears throat> When we get together for drinks, my friends don't mind it when I tell them that the only reason they've always, they're always bragging about the glory and popularity that came with playing high school football is because their lives have since become dull and mediocre, and they have to forget about all those trophies and cheerleaders that they once got and focus on the immediate future. But when they start listing their dis and discussing their sexual conquests, they leave me out of the conversation because I continue to insist that masturbation is good for the prostates. <clears throat> um, next poem is uh, also from that Gutters and Alleyways uh, anthology, which again, I'm, I'm going to keep mentioning it because it's, uh, it's quite good. And it's called Two Intersections. One, I give him a dollar, he gives me the oranges. He nods gracias, takes off his baseball cap wet from the sun wipes his brow on his shoulder, bringing out the original color of the faded t-shirt that he's owned for years. He lifts the dollar up against the unforgiving rays, makes the sign of the cross, folds the bill and puts it into the pocket that feeds his family. He goes to the next car. If they don't buy, he goes to the next car. I go when the light turns green. Two. I stop when the light turns red. He claims hunger and veterancy on cardboard and black magic marker. He wears several layers of clothing despite the heat. He stands and sometimes leans against a pole with two empty bottles at its base. He pulls his pockets inside out to prove his need. He extends his palm, shaking with thirst, with the butt of a freshly lit cigarette sprouting from in between his middle and forefinger. He winks howdy and asks me for a dollar. I give him the oranges. <clears throat> I'm going to read a couple of uh, more poems about my... Uh, my favorite subject, which is my dad. Uh, and uh, let's see if I can get through them without breaking down, which sometimes happens, right? And not that I'm afraid to cry in front of you all. It's just that my face gets even uglier when I cry. And that's the last thing I'm sure you want to see. Uh, so this is called The Dogs. <clears throat> my dad sits on the concrete porch steps that he always sits on after work, even though his house behind him is filled with couches and chairs and a lazy boy recliner that he wouldn't dare sit on for fear of what his, the name might imply. His back still sweaty like his empty beer can. His eyes stare blankly at something too close to focus on or too far to figure out. I go outside and sit down right next to him in silence before we hear sirens blaring three blocks down and the dogs on every block in between start yelping and barking and howling until the screaming sirens fade away. I ask him why the dogs howled and barked and yelped when the sirens pass. He responded without looking at me that the dogs can feel the pain of the person inside the ambulance and sense the death that's following them. Then he asked me to go grab him another beer that I'll drink before he goes inside to watch the news and then fall asleep halfway through because he's always so tired, because he can never sleep, because the dogs are always barking and howling and yelping outside his bedroom window. And I can get to that one. <laughs> Next. Oh, here we go. I'm going to change the pace up a little bit here. It's still about my dad, but uh, aside from being the incredible, incredibly hardworking man that he was, an immigrant and whatnot, um, he is uh, a collector of sorts. And here, let me tell you about that right here. It's called Burro. <clears throat> After mentioning to Mama that on my day off, I drove into East LA to eat what has been called the best burrito in the nation. She hasn't stopped slaving over the stove, stuffing me with an endless combination of tortillas stuffed with her own creation, smiling as she sets the plates before me, seeing how I react to every bite. 
But when I told my dad that I paid 22 bucks for a shot of some premium tequila at a classy hotel lobby bar in downtown the other night, hoping he would allow me a few samples from his decades-old tequila collection, he just shrugged his shoulders, dismissed me with a flick of his wrist, and called me a pendejo. Uh, back to the gutters, this one that is. <clears throat> this is called Climb. <clears throat> and it begins with an epigram or epigraph, I don't know what they're called, but a, a little quote by Pablo Neruda at the beginning that says, how do the oranges divide up sunlight in the orange tree? <clears throat> Let's see how this one goes. From the breakfast table, Dad and I can see the orange tree in our yard, our eyes squinting from the glowing sunlight. Mugs in hand, Dan, Dad had, hands me pan dulce and mentions how much our tree has grown and reminds me of how we used to pick oranges together. It would have been really easy to pluck the bunches that hung low on young branches, but Dad insisted on climbing all the way to the top, thick thorns scraping white stripes onto his sun-baked arms. He said the oranges on top tasted sweeter, when he climbed back down and split open the juicy orb, handing me my half, I would sink my face into it and believe him. Throughout most of my grade school experience, I was told I would end up in fast food due to my failure to turn in homework and my incessant truants. Dad never had the opportunity to attend school. He worked backbreaking labor for most of his life. He would remind me of this whenever he received notes and phone calls from teachers and counselors, then whip me because he felt obligated until I screamed in agony. He would then go outside and climb the tree, picking the highest orange, split it, and place my half in my tear-soaked hands, a sweet apology. He eventually taught me to climb the tree, giving me boost the first couple of times until I learned to climb it myself. Now, Dad gets to rest his retired frame and hardly has the strength to climb the trees at all. I do most of the climbing, thick thorns slice red stripes on my pale indoor arms on my way up. Still, with a few degrees under my belt, a satisfying career in education and plenty of food on the table, things are good. Had I opted for the fast food route, I would have probably made assistant manager by now. However, I doubt that my coffee would taste this warm, my pastry this flaky, my oranges this sweet. Well, I got through that one okay without breaking down, so that's not bad. Um, now I'm going to read a, a poem now uh, about my wife. And I'm sure if she was here, or two poems about my wife, she would hate that I was reading them, but she's not here, is she? So I'm going to go ahead and read them. And I have it on my phone. I hate the fact that I have to do this, but that's where it is, so I'm going to have to read it from there. Um, I couldn't find a hard copy of it. I know it exists somewhere, but I just, just couldn't find it. And <coughs> it's one of those poems where uh, it works, I think to me it works better on paper because the title itself is referred to subtly later on in the poem. So I'm going to tell you what the title is. I'll say it several times and see if you can catch where within the poem the reference is to the title. Okay, it's called, Is That the Parking Break? Okay, is that the parking break? Is that the parking okay? break? Is that the parking break? Got it? Got it. Is that the parking break? Her panties feel pink and silky, so I bet they shine. It's hard to see in the darkness of a car. Street lamp casts shadows in the wrong direction. With her on top, concentrating on neck and face, seat reclined, my hands made it to where her jeans give way at the small of her back. Pursuing, I'd risk a slap in the face. Besides, on a residential street, there are other factors. When cars drive by, we freeze like deer, children, old people. Then continue, my hands constant, fingers inching past elastic borders. When I feel an occasional elbow or forearm accidentally brush my lap, I bet she's asking herself a question and thinking that tonight my balls will feel blue. Okay. Oh, kids in here, right? <laughs> Too late to ask that. Uh, another one about my wife, it's called Intimacy. The fact that she'll never complain about the thick pubes that get swirled and embedded in the bar of ivory soap in the shower, that's intimacy. She can be urinating while I'm brushing my teeth, talking about her day and pause to wipe mid-story without rumination. And she even keeps a G-string in her bedside drawer that she'll use to tie back her hair for fellatio. Still, 
Despite the seemingly frigid comfort that comes with time and practicality, if you remove our blankets on a cold winter evening, I swear steam would rise and cloud your face. <clears throat> oh. Aside from being a husband, I am also a father. Um, and uh, eventually, um, it, it's like having a, uh, I want to have two kids and one wife. Uh, it's like having three roommates, I think. <laughs> I th I, well, to some extent. And this is called, uh, <clears throat> I was at work and I saw somebody put this by, by a, a sink, a sign. It says, to the person who put the sign in the break room that reads, clean up after yourself, your mother doesn't work here. So this is for that person. You know, fathers clean up too. What's more, sometimes father e fathers even clean up after mothers, especially when mothers get the sudden urge to bake. And suddenly there's an army of dirty mixers and bowls and silicone spatulas all congregating around the sink. And all the cereal boxes, cast iron pans, and skillets that are usually hidden from visitors are removed from the oven to allow for a 20-minute batch of brownies to bubble and stiffen. And fathers clean up the stacks of mail that seem to build at every corner of every counter in the house, all of which are addressed to mothers because that which was addressed to fathers got tossed immediately. But mothers invent the probability of importance to the most random of credit card correspondences and catalogs. And fathers clean up after their kids and their Legos, which at the time of purchase may have seemed like a good idea, what with the potential of raising an engineer, only to realize that out of the hundreds of pieces, the kids were only interested in the figures. And they abandoned the rest of the colored polygons that father collected while crawling on the floor, only to realize that they missed the smallest and sharpest piece once they rest one of their already achy knees on it. And fathers even clean their kids' asses. Usually it's just when whatever fathers are watching on television has just gotten good. And the only reason fathers even get up at that point is because they're tired of hearing the boy yell, I'm finished, for the 12th time. <laughs> and fathers learn how to get the job done quickly by wiping and folding and swiping and folding the baby wipe until it's clean enough. And if the father has a daughter, they learn sometimes the hard way. The only way to wipe is from front to back. And fathers even clean up after themselves. All of the empty beer cans that trail fathers from the barbecue grill to the kitchen and then back to the grill and eventually a mass on the rug by the couch where the fathers sit after everyone has gone to bed. And when fathers have their fill of the silence, fathers collect the cans in target bags after pouring into the sink what would have been warm final swigs and toss them into the recycle bin on the side of the house before mothers or kids have a chance to count them. And fathers do this with only a hint of guilt because fathers feel they've earned it after all. And they'll do this on Fridays and Saturdays and on the occasional Sunday, but only if I have Monday off. Um, as a father, I was talking to Jeff earlier about this, uh, I'm chauffeur for the most part. Uh, and, you know, I, so I take my kids to soccer practice, and I like it. I mean, I like, I like watching my kids play. I like watching them compete. I like watching them have fun. Um, the practices are kind of, a, kind of a pain in the ass, but everything else is good. The games are fun. But I still do it because I have to, first of all, but because I kind of like to. It's called Soccer Dad. <coughs> so... The coach scheduled practice at 4 o'clock, and since I get out at 3.30, I have to rush to the sitters and have her wait for me outside with the kids so I don't have to get out of the car. And because I packed their equipment the night before, I can drive straight to the field, and I'll give them each a granola bar or a fruit roll-up on the way. That should hold them over through practice. And I'll take the side streets all the way to avoid as much traffic as possible, and I'll plan an alternate route should I get stuck behind an old blue hair who insists on riding the brake at every shallow dip and intersection. And as long as I don't hit any red lights, I should get there right on time again to let the kids jump out of the car before I can go and park it. Then I can breathe because I made it. I'll even sit in the car for a moment, wait for the current song to end, let the air conditioner blow on my face. For a second, I'll listen to the little clicks my car makes when I turn it off and enjoy how nice it feels to sit in a quietly warming car. Then I'll go and sit near the women who always seem to have something to talk about but never with me. That's okay. All that cackling can't be that interesting. I much prefer watching my kids running around the field with a mob of five-year-olds chasing a ball like a school of fish, or sometimes staying behind and just staring at their hands or the sky. But when somebody scores a goal, my attention goes back to the moms as they scream and pump their sweet Christian fists 
stand and flex their meaty thighs and bounce in their white tank tops and with red and black bras. Oh yeah, just like that. That's nice. Uh, another one about my uh, kids to keep the theme going here. And this is called Nonage. <coughs> My boy insists on wearing camouflage all the time, holding a branch for a gun, kicking up the decorative wood chips to imagine near-miss explosions as he's running, and throwing rotting lemons like grenades. He'll play with toy soldiers on the grass until his cloaked knees get caked with mud. He'll stand them far too close to necessitate the high-powered weapons that they forever hold, mimicking rapid fire with more spit than sound. While I don't discourage the creativity and really innocuousness that accompanies pretend play, I may worry if this insistence is prolonged into high school, where his peers will stare as he walks down a hallway and wonder out loud why he's always dressed that way, mere whispers to his ears. And they'll eventually call him a weirdo and surround him and push him for not looking like the jocks. And he'll never get the chance to explain to them that he's just clinging to his youth because he'll be forced to retaliate the only way he knows how, like a soldier, no doubt, the American way. I have another one on my phone uh, uh, where I, I, I read that er earlier poem, Tongue, which is one of the uh, first poems that I ever had published. This is a, actually a poem that I wrote uh, this week, and I haven't even printed, one, uh, printed up a copy yet, so let's see how this one goes. Uh, I don't have the luxury that I used to have when I was in college of workshopping the poems, right? You get a lot of eyes on it and see if it works or not. Now, occasionally, I'll read them out loud to my wife and see, what do you think, what do you think? And while she's kind of watching TV or using her own phone, she'll say, oh, that's good, that's good. You know, right? So I don't know how, you know, how much credibility that, um, that has, but anyway. Uh, this is called Dad Bod. <coughs> a possibly svelte muscular body was a sacrifice I was willing to make just for you. I mean, how could I resist that teachable moment when I showed you that if you hold two french fries together and dip them into the paper tub, you can shovel, with the right balance, an exponential amount of ketchup. Then I illustrated this to you again, and then a few more times for good measure. And I would never reject the crescent moon of your cheeseburger, somehow delicious and disgusting, that you couldn't finish, the pickle already gone, a taste you no doubt acquired in the womb that you insisted I consume because you knew you wouldn't be allowed to explore that filthy fast food play place until you finished your, fruit, your food. And sure, I'll spend my afternoon playing catch with you. Just be aware that such a beautiful day requires the steady practice of day drinking. And because an 18-pack is a much better value than a 12-er, compounded with the possibility of an unexpected guest, then you know why I had to buy two. Remember, you sat in the shopping cart, not in the seat where you face me when I push, your puny feet swinging, kicking me in the nads, another of my sacrifices, but actually in the cart, and you placed your butt on the two cases, I don't mind a couple of warm beers, as I shopped and bought the chorizo that I would toss on the rack above the chicken that I grill, and I show you how the grease that drips from the above bastes the meats below. Despite this body that just screams dad to the rest of the world, in your eyes I have abominable strength. Continue ignoring that poolside, my pecs look more like peaks. My teats, one low hanging, one veering right, making my torso look like the face of a confused albino chameleon. Because when you ask me to lift you and toss you across the pool, I do it with ease. And from where you land, mere inches from me, or is it miles, you watch me swim, no, glide across the pool with falpian grace. Also ignore, in case you figured it out, that my feet are tiptoeing across the pool's plaster floor and marvel at me as I reach up and grab the diving board and do a set of pull-ups with ease, your eyes wide at the slight definition in my biceps, your mind innocent of the buoyancy of fat. Um, now, this next poem, uh, I've never, ever gotten through it without just completely breaking down and blubbering. So, uh, I'm going to try it. Uh, but, well, let's see how this goes. Let me try it first. <clears throat> but we might have to do a little interactive thing here, which I had planned. Uh, I'm a seventh grade teacher, for the most part, uh, so we do, I, in order to get my kids engaged, I, we do a lot of interactive activities. I, I rarely, rarely just stand there and talk for very much time at all, but, uh, so I, I, I'd like to do something like that. But let me, let me, let me see if I can get through this. Um, 
find it. Here it is. It's called Potential. Uh, and I, I've, I've tried reading it over and over and over uh, at home. But even when I'm reading it to myself, I can't get through it. I mean, maybe I'm just a little bit being oversensitive. It's, it's about my son. I'll admit that much. And, uh, but I don't know. I just can't get through it. So. But I'm going to try it because I don't, I don't like to quit. Uh, but I probably will. When you, uh, potential, it's called. <clears throat> when you consider the science, it makes sense. And I'm sure William Rankine had more than a ball at the top of the hill in mind when he scribbled down some numbers into an equation and realized it, potential energy. Like the, like the potential I've realized within you, the electrons bouncing around inside of you like searchlights we saw in the distance, as, zigza as zigzagging beams on the low clouds, and you followed them with your eyes, and I was sure you had discovered the patterns as they became predictable. But it was time for bed, and I was positive those lights were advertising the grand opening of a brand new strip club in a more industrial part of town, but you didn't need to know that. So I gave you a few more seconds to affirm that the pattern you were regarding was true. It is the same potential that must have been there when you were lying on your belly, playing with your pile of dinosaurs, that fantastic innocence that allows you to snarl like your tiny raptors, chasing action figures until they're pounced upon, and the way you speak of these creatures, I'm sure that when you blew out the candles on your Brachiosaurus birthday cake, you wished for nothing more than for those dinosaurs to reanimate. And I wouldn't dare squash this by suggesting that your wish would only create chaos and death and a path of destruction and how the military would have to get involved. And I can only imagine all those smelly protesters and the higher taxes, both state and federal. So instead of I foster these thoughts by helping you search the hillside for mosquitoes stuck in amber, and the potential that was there when you dug the hole with my gardening trowel so that you could play with your tractors rumbling through your pursed lips, the, per the perspiration sticking to your hair to your forehead like stalactites beneath one of those floppy hats that your mom insists you wear. And I couldn't just push you away when I noticed the thick root at the bottom of that hole that forced me to look back at the long crack that runs the length of our concrete patio, opposite of which is the cracked cinder block wall that separates us from our neighbors and their goddamn ficus tree. Nor could I mention the stern letter that would declare a lawsuit I was formulating in my head. Rather, I poured a little water into the hole and watched as you sought to rectify this sudden flood with your diggers and dozers. And the potential that is there when you sit in the yard with your sad, pouting face after you get punished because your teacher emails your mom saying that you refuse to conform to the rules, but don't tell your mom that I'm secretly proud of this, especially when the rules encourage a five-year-old to sit down and shut up. So I extend my hands to ask, so I extend my hands to you and ask you if you want me to spin you around, and you grin and grab my arms at the wrists, your grip a mere formality, and I grab your forearms and we spin, your feet flailing a bit at first, but momentum carries you, and I could swear there is lead in your shoes, and already your potential energy is revealing itself as kinetic, your jewels off the charts, and for a second it's just your eyes and mine, and the world around is a blurry swirl. The, s the sound of the breeze rustling the waxy eucalyptus leaves is like applause just for you, and I refuse to stop, although in my head I'm thinking about the possibility uh, of, a, of dislocating your shoulders and a trip to the ER and co-payments and the possible visit from a social worker. But I don't mention this because your incessant laughter tells me that for now you just want me to continue this spin. But I'm certain that with all this dizzying inertia, if I were to let go, and eventually I will have to, you will soar. Oh, I mean, how do you know I got through that one? Uh, all right. Oh, my novel, Stephen Isn't Normal. Uh, which is for sale here, and there's some stickers out there, so you can, they're free, and some buttons and stuff, so you can put the stickers on your skateboard, or uh, in, in a bathroom stall wall, and not at the school, somewhere else, because uh, that might be vandalism. Uh, it, uh, it's my first novel, and it's the first of, of three. Uh, the second one is just about finished, I was telling Jeff. I just have to kind of edit it, and uh, you know, between Soccer Dad and Intimacy, I don't have any time, so I will eventually get to it. Um, uh, and the third one is, is also uh, pretty much done, but I just need to edit it. But, uh, so they're sequels of sorts, whereas a lot of the characters that you'll come across in the novel, Stephen is normal. Uh, the second one deals with, the second novel deals with uh, one of the characters that this Stephen came across. 
uh, and you see how that interaction took place through the eyes of that character. So, and then the third one is still another character that also comes out in this one. But uh, so they're all kind of intertwined in some way, although not necessarily sequels because, well, I won't tell you any more beyond that. Um, Stephen isn't normal. <coughs> I'll read to you the first chapter. It's and all the chapters are relatively short. It's one of those, uh, take it into the bathroom, and by the time you're done, you'll be done with the chapter kind of thing. So, uh, <coughs> Chapter 1. Stephen Moresco isn't normal. He's retarded. At least that's what people say. They say he's retarded because that's what he is, retarded. By definition, mostly, but retarded nonetheless. They say this as nonchalantly as they say that that Consuelo's fat, crazy Pedro's crazy, or that old man Felipe is an old man. That's what they are. That's what Stephen is. He's a retard. Stephen doesn't think he's retarded, but that doesn't matter because nobody cares what Stephen thinks. Since his, since his pathetic childhood, nobody has cared what Stephen's thought. All most people have ever known was that he was retarded, or so they say. People don't just say he's retarded. They also say that he's crazy, stupid, slow, idiotic, moronic, psychotic, loco, menso, pendejo. People have been saying these things about Stephen and directly to his face for most of his life. By people, I mean his parents, siblings, friends, neighbors, teachers, business owners, passers-by, just about everybody that Stephen has ever known, met, seen, or has heard of, of him. Stephen doesn't know that so many people are calling him names. He only knows of a few. If he did know, he probably wouldn't care. He's used to it. He's heard it enough so that it no longer registers as an insult. As a child, Stephen was teased at school for his poor mental capacity and his extreme weight. His mental capacity was not based on academic potential. It was based on events. His extreme weight was due to the fact that he ate tremendous portions. His mother served him that way. Stephen just ate them. His mother insisted that he eat everything on his plate before he would be allowed to leave the table. So Stephen would eat everything on his plate. He would do this with the fervor of somebody who was about to receive great compensation for a job well done. Unfortunately, that never occurred. He was just given temporary freedom. In kindergarten, Stephen pissed himself in front of the class. It wasn't entirely his fault. His mother always gave him orange juice in the morning, along with three scrambled eggs, toast, and a pile of bacon. She, assist, she insisted that he drink the entire glass, regardless of his lack of thirst. He drank it. She also insisted that he eat all the food on his plate. He did, with his usual fervor. That day, during recess, Stephen was riding a silver tricycle around a white track that was crudely painted onto the rough asphalt playground. His fellow students laughed at Stephen as he rounded the corners. One wheel lifted off the ground, threatening to spill Stephen's five-year-old bulbous frame onto the floor. He never fell, but the anticipation was enough to even get his teacher to giggle and stop him. Careful, Stephen, you don't want to fall and hurt yourself. She told Stephen this every time he rode the tricycles. Stephen knew he didn't want to fall. He knew he didn't want to hurt himself. Still, he stopped for the sake of eliminating any further criticism. After riding the tricycle, Stephen drank water out of the fountain all the other kids refused to use. A kid had stuck a twig into the fountain, causing the water to come out in an awkward trajectory. Stephen didn't care about the water's trajectory. He was thirsty. He drank the water. Because of the fact that none of the kids used the fountain, Stephen was allowed more time to drink the water. He wasn't being shoved from behind. He wasn't being told to hurry. He was, he was being pointed to and laughed at by the other kids for using the fountain that had a twig in it. It didn't bother Stephen. Stephen just drank and drank. After recess, Stephen's teacher gave him a carton of milk. Stephen wasn't thirsty, but his teacher insisted that he drink it. So he drank it in just a few large gulps that forced some of the milk to roll out of the corners of his mouth, cascading down his chin and throat, creating two dark pools on the neck of his faded navy blue t-shirt. Within minutes, Stephen had to urinate. He had to ask for permission to use the facilities. Stephen's teacher had always told him to raise his hand if he had a question. Stephen raised his hand. He kept it in the air straight as an exclamation point for what seemed hours. It only seemed like hours because his desire to urinate was so strong that it even changed his ability to sit properly. Hence, he was very uncomfortable for those few minutes that seemed like hours. He kept his hand in the air as he watched his teacher help another student replace eight fat crayons into a yellow and green box. He kept it in the air as he watched the teacher hold the child's finger and maneuver it over a piece of paper with a big black R on it. He kept it, his hand in the air as he felt his lap warm with liquid that was gushing out of his body, on his chunky legs, through his pants, onto his socks, the arches of his feet, and into the inner soles of his tight brown shoes. He kept his hand in the air as the boy sitting next to him noticed the darkening of Stephen's pants and the puddle that was forming at Stephen's feet. He kept his hand in the air as the student sitting next to Stephen announced to the class that Stephen had pissed in his pants to a sudden burst of laughter. He kept his hand in the air until the teacher finally turned to look at him, laughter in her eyes, and told Stephen to put his hand down, which Stephen did. She didn't ask Stephen to state his question. She asked him to go and see the nurse. He did this with laughter behind him, steady as applause, as he exited the classroom. 
From that point on, his fellow classmates started telling Stephen that he had to wear a diaper, that he didn't know how to hold it in, that he smelled like pee. Stephen didn't like the teasing much, but he didn't like it much when he was sent to the nurse that day, and she told him the very same thing. He also didn't like it when he was sent home and his mother told him the very same thing. Nor would he have liked it had he known that right after school, his kindergarten teacher burst into the teacher's workroom laughing hysterically, barely able to tell all her colleagues the story of the stupid kid that pissed himself. By the time his fellow students started teasing him, the words ceased to have much effect. He sort of ignored his fellow students. His ignoring them was translated into st stupidity or retardation, if you will. Don't you know you're not supposed to pee on yourself? Are you retarded? Yes. Stephen was answering the first question. The students naturally assume that the answer was directed toward the latter. In the second grade, Stephen had volunteered to participate in the spelling race. He was to race one of his fellow students, a girl named Barbara. Barbara knew she would win e easily. She thought, I'm going to beat this retard easily. She did, although not as easily as imagined. The idea was that the teacher was going to announce a word. The first of the two students to spell the word correctly on the chalkboard would win. It was a very productive time in Stephen's education. The teacher announced the word, chicken. Stephen began writing, his left meaty hand moving the chalk along the coarse green board as quickly as possible. The fact that Stephen was left-handed seemed strange to some of Stephen's classmates. They would say things like, you write weird. Stephen didn't think it was weird, it was just natural, as natural as anything Stephen or anybody did or learned. As Stephen was writing the word on the board, some students were looking at his left hand. Stephen was also, he was writing fast. To everybody's surprise, especially Barbara's, Stephen and Barbara finished writing at the same time. Okay, let's see, the teacher said. She had to check for spelling. That was a rule, after all. Barbara spelled the word correctly. Stephen, on the other hand, spelled chichen. He had forgotten to put the little line above the H that would have made it a K. Naturally, the classroom laughed at Stephen as loudly and steadily as they did that day in kindergarten. The teacher even laughed as she shook her head and asked Stephen to sit down. Stephen sat down. To make matters worse, fried chicken was being served in the cafeteria for lunch that day. <laughs> yeah, I know. So all the students couldn't help but saying things like, you can eat your chichen? This chichen tastes nasty. I don't like chichen. They made sure to say these things loud enough for Stephen and as many other people as possible uh, could hear and laugh. Then they would shake their heads contemplatively and say to themselves, sheesh, chichen, what a retard. Stephen is retarded. They would say this to his face, to their friends, to their teachers, to their parents. Eventually it caught on and stayed with him throughout his years at school. In fact, now in his late 20s, Stephen is known as Stephen the Retard around his neighborhood. Only now, Stephen is retarded. Stephen still doesn't care what people say. The neighbors call him a retard when he's walking down the street. There goes Stephen the Retard. The neighborhood children call him a retard when they see him on the front yard. Hello, Stephen the Retard. The mailman and ice cream man deliver the same salutation. Hi, Stephen the Retard. That's what Stephen hears. They don't always say Stephen the Retard. Not to his face anyway, not all the time. They sometimes just say, there goes Steve. Hello, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Stephen always hears the addition of the retard because he's heard it all his life. Stephen tells his mother that everybody calls him Stephen the retard. Stephen's mother, Martha, acts surprised when she hears this, even though she already knows they call him a retard because Stephen has been telling her so for over a dozen years. She's overheard, overheard the neighborhood, I'm sorry, she's overheard the neighbors talking of Stephen in that fashion. In fact, she's called him a retard countless times, along with stupid, idiot, moron, tonto, menso, pendejo. She called him stupid the first and only time that Stephen told her he wanted what he wanted to do when he grew up. Stephen was 12 when he told her, I want to make Coca-Cola. I want to work where they put Coca-Cola into the bottles. He said this after watching the opening credits for a Laverne and Shirley television show reel. That's stupid. That was all she said. Stephen never said anything else about it. Stephen's mother, as a superficial means of consolation, tells him not to listen to what people say about him, that one day he'll be normal again. She says, don't listen to what uh, people say. One day, with the help of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, you'll be normal again. Stephen's mother is a devout Christian. She was reborn a Christian after her Catholic first husband, Rogelio, died. Until then, she was a devout Catholic. Back then, she believed that Christ, with the help of his virgin mother and a handful of saints, would help make Stephen normal. Now, she believes that only Christ will make Stephen normal. Stephen believes that he already is relatively normal, that is, as normal as anybody else. He doesn't tell his mother this. He just listens to his mother's constant reassurance. He knows his mother's words are free of tenderness. He knows his mother's words are merely a front, a distraction, a way of getting Stephen to drop his guard and to trust her. That is why he decided to kill her. Chapter 1. Now you want to read Chapter 2? Oh. <laughs> I won't read it out loud. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Um, but I am going to read just a couple more poems. 
Uh, and it, again, that the book is uh, available there. Uh, is, and again, the stickers and some pins and there's some bookmarks too. Those are free. You can help yourself to those and uh, use them though. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I am a, I'm a teacher, seventh grade teacher. I used to teach at uh, East LA College for about 10 years. Uh, go, what are they, Roadrunners? Aztecs? East LA College? I don't know. I, I went to Rio Hondo. They're Roadrunners. I don't know what, what they call the, the East LA College. Vikings. Oh, you're the Vikings here? Yeah, all right, all right, Vikings. That's appropriate, I guess, right? Long Beach, Vikings. No, that's, that's not appropriate. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty uh, arbitrary. Anyway, uh, I don't know what East LA College is. I should, but I don't. But I taught there for 10 years, and then uh, at, at the same time, I was teaching uh, middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, which I currently teach now. I'm an intervention teacher. I teach uh, newcomer kids, kids new to the country because I'm bilingual. Uh, and uh, I've been doing that for a lot of years. I also teach AVID. Um, but uh, I, I really like working with, 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 with the youngsters. Uh, I, I, f I think um, at that age, uh, they can either go toward education or not. And especially, I, I teach in the city of Bell Gardens, which is a predominantly Latino community, uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of poverty, I guess you could say, and a lot of gangs and whatnot. So I, I think I, I I belong there. I think I need to be there, um, which is probably why I kind of I stopped teaching at the college. I could have stayed there, and uh, but I uh, I wanted to focus on my on the on the kids on the. Middle schoolers, because middle school is kind of tough to begin with. I, I remember middle school for me, I, I couldn't stand it, I hated it. Uh, but uh, there was always a couple of teachers that made it more bearable, and I hope to be that teacher to some of these kids. Um, but I don't always feel that way. It's called Mister. It's on those days when obviously nobody's paying attention except to their mechanical pencils and the drama that started during lunch, and then the yawning starts and everybody's looking at the clock. And as I wander the class, tapping on the corners of desks to wake them up, and I get a whiff of that seventh grade stink that I've been smelling since they ran the mile on that especially hot Friday, and I hear the zippers of backpacks whizzing mid-discussion 15 minutes before the bell even rings, and when it does, everybody shuffles out without so much as a, have a nice day, mister. And I'm as relieved as them that the day is over. And with sunken eyes as I'm locking my door, I realize that it is only Tuesday, and that I have to walk down to a meeting that could have easily been replaced with an email, and I just know that that fucking teacher is going to ask a million questions, all of which had already been answered. Uh, it is on those days that I wonder, how many sick days can I take if I throw myself down the stairs? But then, there are those other days, when everything seems to be going right, and the way I explain things seems to have gone through to most of them, and they're nodding in agreement and even adding to the discussion something that actually has something to do with what's being discussed. And they're asking relevant questions, and I'm answering them with answers that make things make sense, but they can't quite articulate this because it's not often that it all makes sense to them. It's on those days that I realize why I'm here with these English language learning, immigrant parented, low income household children who are everything that I ever was. <coughs> Hasn't always been, uh, as, a, as a student, uh, I've always worked, so I've, I haven't always been a teacher, obviously. I've had a, some shit jobs, as they call them, and uh, this is about one of those. Calling in. The telephone woke me at 9.30 a.m. It was work. They were calling to ask if I was home. I cupped the receiver and told them that I wasn't. They asked me if I knew where I was. I said I had left for work two hours ago. They thanked me and asked me to ask me, if I saw me, to call work when I got in. I said I would, hung up, and fell back to sleep easily, knowing that I had nearly 24 hours to think up a death in the family. <laughs> uh, the thing about working and uh, going to college and stuff, uh, I'm sure you guys can relate. Uh, it was the, the commute. I, I, yes, sir. OK. <laughs> uh, The commute was terrible, and I got a lot of tickets al along the way. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you about that some other time. I'm going to end it now with uh, a poem called The Chi Chi Chu. Perhaps we named it that because it was kind of round, but freakishly pointy, as only an innocent would envision something they've only seen within t shirts and sweaters but never in the flesh, or because of the more realistic mounds on the trunk that may once have birthed branches 
that allowed just enough leverage for my Buster Brown feet to climb. Below, a naughty maze of roots and dirt sprinkled with cigarette butts and embedded bottle caps. Regardless, it is where we all met on evenings before cable television and video games, scrambling to make our way up, a net of limbs just above our adolescent heads, but still within an easy climb's reach. Once up, we'd lean against the forgiving branches alive beneath our spines and talk of girls and skateboarding and girls and school and girls and girls until we hoped our mothers would forget to call us in for dinner, some of us looking down at where the dirt becomes grass. But some of us, we looked up at the unbelievable blueness of the sky, and it was dark. We saw stars. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have a chance to answer a few questions that students might have about sure. writing or in general? <coughs> students, questions? Students. Any? Yes, sir. Um, two ways. One of them, he, he was a, it was a neighbor of mine who was who had uh, some uh, uh, mental capacities. Uh, who was a really good friend of mine. That was one way. Another way is it's it, it had to do with uh, thematically it had to do with the the whole idea that nobody is normal, right? Everybody has flaws. Some of us just wear it on our sleeve. Uh, Whereas, uh, and, and also, in the, especially in the Latino culture, there's a lot of uh, name calling that is, it, it, it's, it's, I don't think it's necessarily uh, cynical, it's just, that's what it is. I had a brother, uh, well, I have a brother, and uh, when we were younger, uh, he was chubby, and they called him Gordo. Gordo means fat. Uh, and I, t until I was maybe nine, I didn't know that his name was not Gordo. I thought his name was Gordo, because that's what everybody <laughs> called him. And his name is Guillermo, but he, he was always Gordo, and, and that's kind of, thematically, that's where it goes, where everybody has like that one nickname that sticks with them, and there's no way really of escaping. Questions? Yes, sir. Sorry, you're out of really mean to even in that first Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, the, the, the narrator is. Yeah. The narrator's yeah, created. Yeah, yeah. I, that's not me, that's the narrator. Yeah, the, the narrator. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Only mean to, so how do you, you as the writer. Sure. Right? Um, decide how much is too much or how much isn't enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've often uh, thought about the, 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 you know, the use of the, the R word and, uh, and all, the, all the, the, the way that I refer to him. But I, again, the narrator is created to, he, he, the narrator was meant to be as big a dick as everybody that he encounters in the story. Uh, and that, that's kind of, that was my thinking as I, as I was writing it. Like he's, yeah, I know he's he's mean. He's an asshole, but uh, you know everybody who, every, his, from his mom to his friends at school, I mean, he's surrounded by assholes. And, uh, he, but he, and then yeah, he's the one who's being called retard. Right? So that, that's kind of where it, it's, it was headed. So I, ho I hope I didn't offend anybody, but uh, or maybe I hope I did, because that would get you more intrigued. Oh, I would intrigue me. <laughs> uh, did I answer your question? Uh, um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, uh, you you don't, you have to uh, hope for redemption at some point. I think, uh, uh, and I don't want to you know give much away, but uh, that's that that's what motivated that first chapter is that you, you hope for redemption. You, even though this guy is uh, talked down to as much as he is, you, that's what kind of drives the story ultimately. I mean, I mean, I, I, I would hope that you you want him to kill his mom by the time you get to the end of this book, right? And which is kind of a weird thing to say, but that's the I mean, sheer mind. Uh, I, I hope I answered your question. Right there. <laughs> sure. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Are the, the red ends on the title, will we have to like, buy the book? No. Well, uh, will it get you to buy the book? Then yes. No, but it, actually, it's, uh, it, it's, it's I, I, you know, that's funny. That, that question gets asked quite often. It, the ends are uh, the, the idea of looking for patterns and what otherwise would be random. Right? And, and I, when I looked at the title, I'm like, oh, look, there's an end at the, the end of the first word, at the beginning, or in the middle of the second word, and at the beginning of the, first, or the third word. And then I started looking at it. it. It's just the idea of finding patterns. 
And even in the most random things, the whole chaos theory, right? You, it, we find patterns in the most random things. So that's basically what it is. Nothing more profound than that. Again. And another question. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. um, we can call it Steven and normal because Steven is the R word would have been too much. Uh, it was originally, for the longest time, it was called Steven is retarded. And then my editor suggested, and then, I, and then he also, my editor also suggested, there's another book uh, from back in the 70s called My Brother Steven is Retarded. Oh. Um, and uh, I didn't even know. And I'm like, what? He stole my title? It <laughs> 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 didn't quite work, right? So uh, I guess it was more uh, acceptable back then. And that kind of goes along with the whole theme of the novel, too, how it is acceptable in some, in some circles, it really is. Yes, sir? Um, when you get an idea about something that you know to write, is there any specific thing that comes into play which determines whether you're going to do fiction or poetry? Um, now, uh, I'm kind of lazy. I turn it into poetry. Poetry to me is much easier to write because it's, even though it's narrative, uh, the, the, the poetry that I write is mostly narrative poetry. It's like little stories, right? And uh, the hard part of it is uh, kind of thinning it out to, so that the story is more precise. That's what kind of poetry is. Uh, but uh, sometimes what would have been a poem ends up as one of the little stories within the novel itself. So uh, if I if I'm in the middle of writing a novel and something occurs to me, I'm going to put it in the novel. If I'm not writing a novel, then it's going to become a poem. Probably. That's probably the way it goes. But I don't save stuff for, for the novel. Right. Questions? Yeah. Well, again, uh, thank you for your attention and for hanging in there, man. That's uh, kind of a long time for to be sitting there. Normally, we would be standing up and doing some class and stuff as an avid teacher. But uh, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>